This is the most heartbreaking image for me in any Miyazaki movie. This is a four-year-old girl who's been really truly struggling with her mom being sick in the hospital and being away from the family for an indefinite time span. And then just when May and her sister had received news that mom was well enough to come home for the weekend, they get the news that she got an infection and her weekend visit has been canceled. And both girls are devastated. Satsuki, who's 10, is dealing with a slightly more sophisticated understanding of the situation. She's worried about her mom health, worried she's gonna die, but May is only four years old and she just misses her mom. There is so much being conveyed through this image. Kids don't have many tools to deal with tough emotions. Playing is one of their only ways of dealing with what they're experiencing. It's something they know how to do, something they know makes them happy. And you can see May tried playing. She got out all of her toys and she tried playing with them because that's all she knows how to do to make herself feel better and nothing worked. You can almost feel the desperation through how scattered everything is. You can imagine her just going from one toy to the next and not understanding why none of it is helping. She even tried getting herself a drink of water. That's something else she knows how to do. Maybe that's something dad sometimes gets for her when she's upset, but that didn't work either. And also May is someone we've seen really struggle with being alone, being without her sister. And now with Satsuki needing time to herself and mom and dad both gone, May truly has no one. She tried to handle being by herself the best she could, but she's too young and this is already so much for someone her age. And like you look at how she's not even crying here. That's how intense this feeling is. You can imagine her lying there just imagining her mom, remembering her mom being next to her, holding her hand, smiling at her, just missing mom, nothing but missing mom. Can't think about anything else. How many storytellers can show this much with just one image? It's unbelievable. We're seeing a child's whole afternoon play out. There's a whole emotional journey here that's already happened, and even the end point of that afternoon, which is just stillness. She's not doing anything. That itself has been set up through the narrative and through the character's personality to convey via contrast so much about how she's feeling, how she's processing what's happening to her. I have a super sensitive spot in my heart for younger siblings struggling, which is a topic I made a video about before, and that's what made me interested in taking a second look at this movie. It was almost shocking how differently I took this story, seeing it again for the first time in maybe 15 years. I had remembered it as this fun, lighthearted movie about kids running around with magical creatures and cat buses and enjoying countryside life. And this time around, there was so much under the surface, so much darkness, so much conflict that these kids are struggling with, and so much nuance in how it's all being explored. And it's not like this movie is sad. It is a movie full of joy and full of magic, and it is designed for that stuff to be at the forefront. The darker stuff is supposed to be under the surface, but what I'm starting to see is that it's not under the surface like an undercurrent, it's more of a foundation the whole story is built upon. I'm going to give my analysis of this movie as a whole, but I'm going to warn you there's a problem with it. There's a very deep flaw with the ideas I'm about to present. And the process of dealing with that flaw made this video into something unlike anything I've ever uploaded on my channel. Structurally, just be prepared for something way different. Okay, anyway, without further ado, here's my theory. So the magic in this movie isn't random, it appears at specific times. At first glance, it seems like Totoro is just something May stumbles upon randomly when she's playing in the garden, but think about the character for a second. What is May's strongest need? What's her primary conflict? It's that she's a four-year-old girl who needs a lot of love and companionship and attention, just like any four-year-old girl. And the world continually leaves her without any of that. And I'm not just talking about her mom and the sadness and desperation we see there and what that eventually causes May to do. It's almost as unbearable for her when Satsuki has to go to school and May is left alone just for the day. And she misses her sister so much that she has to go to school just to be with her. And it's embarrassing for both of them. That's just how it feels to be four. It's not easy. So now back to Totoro. What's happening in this scene when May first discovers him? It's not as simple as May just playing in the garden. Sasuke goes to school and this is actually the first time we see May left alone. No companionship, no attention. She tries to get that from her dad. She's talking to him, telling him what she's up to, trying to get him involved. She tries giving him little gifts, a bunch of flowers. And when kids do this stuff, it's cute, but they're not doing it to be cute. They definitely don't know it, but there's subconscious psychological forces at play here, just like anything humans do. May is doing what she can, what she knows how to do, in order to get her emotional needs taken care of. But her dad just can't provide that for her in this moment. And it's not his fault. He's not even being mean or dismissive or anything. He just has to work. And because of that, he cannot give her the attention and company she needs. But then, before May can get upset, what does she find? Not just magic. She finds magic that is mirroring her situation, her current subconscious emotional state. She finds the little Totoros who are too busy for her. They are running away from her, just like her dad, just like her sister, just like her mother. In her four-year-old subconscious, that 
is how it feels to be Mei right now. But the important difference here is that in this magical scenario, unlike in real life, Mei has agency. She can chase after the Totoros, and if she does, if she tries hard enough, it leads her to the parent Totoro, coincidentally enough, who she can hug and love, and most importantly, wake up. Again, she can exercise agency in getting it to notice her. When else do we see magic? Sasuke and Mei are waiting for their dad at the bus stop. He's not coming. The world again is abandoning them both. No one is coming to take care of them to provide for their needs. And at that moment, who shows up? Once again, it's our parent-sized Totoro friend, who even has his own bus as well. And again, we see Satsuki, who was without agency in the real world, is now able to exercise agency in this magical encounter. She's able to get this big companion to pay attention to her, and even to reciprocate affection towards her in the form of this little gift. She was in this position where she was doing her best to stay strong and resilient in the face of these real-world challenges that had deprived her of her emotional needs, and it's like the universe rewarded her by giving her this magic that fulfilled her emotional needs existence. Exactly. The most innocuous example of this, which is also by far the clearest, is the nighttime vegetable patch scene, where we see this play out to a T like it's a formula. The children really wanted something, and now we see if they try hard enough, the universe will answer back and provide them with exactly what they want. And then of course the climax unfolds under this principle as well. Mei is trying as hard as she can to get the corn to her mom, Satsuki is trying as hard as she can to find Mei, and only after they exhaust all that willpower does the universe grant them their magical reward, fulfilling their needs exactly via superhero Totoro and his magic cad bus. If you can't tell by my voice and how I'm describing this, I find this idea of magic very disturbing. Magic in Miyazaki movies is usually a method of putting characters into conflict, whether that's a curse like in Princess Mononoke in Howl's Moving Castle, or taking away loved ones like in Spirited Away, or there's a bird that keeps trying to fight you like in The Boy and the Heron, or the whole world is cursed like in Nausicaa. Magic puts these characters into situations that will require development, that will require real transformations to occur internally for them in order for them to find their way back to a real world that doesn't have magic. And yes, ultimately these conflicts are opportunities to mature and grow as a human being, so it is a good thing big picture, but the magic itself in the moment is painful, it's distressing, it's threatening. And you compare that to My Neighbor Totoro and we see the opposite. Every time the real world provides these children with an opportunity to mature, to grow, to learn the coping mechanisms that all children develop, magic comes in and prevents that from happening. And instead it gives them this message that all you need to do is try hard and the magic will just come along and heal your emotional pain. And by trying hard, it's not overcoming anything internally, it's not changing, it's just persisting in that state of need without actually growing. In fact, it's children who have this magical I just need to try hard mindset who would do something like May did at the end of the movie. They would run off without having internally developed any of the tools necessary to accomplish what they wanted to do. And they would just trust in their own willpower's magical abilities to unlock the cosmic magic forces that will grant me success. And I don't even need to tell you, if a real kid did this, it would not end like it does in the movie. And that's something we see in the magic itself. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about these two subtle details. When Mei eventually gets tired and she stops to rest near some statues, those are called Jizo statues, which you typically find in Japanese cemeteries. And you also have the heading on the cat bus before it switches to Mei. It reads Path to the Graveyard. It's the movie acknowledging what would happen if there wasn't magic, which in real life, there isn't. Four-year-olds who run off at night on on their own sadly do end up dying. They do end up at the bottom of lakes because there is no Totoro in the real world. There is no magic, there's no Santa Claus, there's no Tooth Fairy, and that's a big part of growing up. It's having imaginary friends and conjuring up magical ways the world works and then seeing that all that is not true. Magic doesn't exist, Santa Claus isn't real, and that's okay because those crushing moments of unbearable frustration and pain, just like the unbearable pain caused by magic and other Ghibli movies, that is what leads to you developing the mental tools and mental fortitude to take on a world without magical saviors. It's what growing out of childhood does and should consist of. And what follows from this reading of the story is that the reason why this movie feels so nostalgically beautiful, which it absolutely does, it does feel like some profound childhood experience and magical wonder. The reason it feels that way is not because it's reflecting some deep human truth, but because it reflects a deep human wish. And it doesn't just reflect that wish, it fills us with false hopes for that wish. We yearn for a world that works like this. It's something we have wanted ever since we were kids and did have those magical mindsets. The terrible things that happened to all of us, all of you, everyone watching this as kids, whether it was minor traumas or major traumas, that's the stuff that made us who we are today that's undeniable, it played a vital role in our lives, but we also have a lot of resentment towards it. And there's an inner child in us that still wants to believe in magic, still wants to believe in that timeline 
one where we didn't have to feel that pain. We didn't need the trauma of that transformation we went through from kid to grown up. We could have just persisted as kids in that peaceful childhood world. And the universe magically would have just bent its will to us rather than the other way around. This movie allows its adult audience to live out that childhood fantasy. And for its child audience, it encourages them to stay true to that childhood fantasy despite it being a fantasy. Despite it not being how the world really works. So that was my initial analysis of My Neighbor Totoro. And upon reflection, I thought it was cohesive. It had good support from the narrative, explained the emotional impact I felt, and I'm sure a lot of other people were feeling. And also, it horrified me. This analysis felt so wrong on every level. Everything about it was just so anti-Ghibli. And I don't just mean the harsh moral judgment that I was making on the movie's messaging, but also the treatment of magic itself that my analysis was presupposing. It's simplistic. It's seeing magic as the superficial formula that's wish-based, like make a wish and blow out the candles type simplistic. In no other Ghibli movie is magic treated as this shallow. That was my main problem with this analysis. But as I said, it's not like it doesn't fit. The whole way magic does match up exactly with the kid's needs, the system of them trying hard and being rewarded, that does fit. It's just, if it's a question of either A, this is the most accurate and true understanding of the movie, and Miyazaki actually made a movie like this, or B, I made a mistake, I'm wrong, I'm option B all the way on this one. It is unfathomable to me that Miyazaki would make a movie like the one I'm describing. I'm not putting Miyazaki on a pedestal here. It's not like I think he's some kind of superhuman genius. He absolutely has areas where he's sloppy or basic or just off, but not childhood and not magic. Never those. I've seen way too much of his work to believe he's capable of writing a story with a shallow of an understanding of either childhood or magic. Everything I've ever seen from him about either of those topics has been profound, and it's only gotten more insightful and more meaningful the more I look into it. And then also on top of all this, there were some conspicuous gaps left by my analysis. There's a lot about what Totoro is and how he acts, his personality, and how the girls interact with him that my theory just wasn't touching. And there are other details like the cat bus as well that seemed like there was just more going on there. And probably most importantly, the whole sequence with May and the corn. All of that was given just too much attention to detail for the level of nuance or lack of nuance that I was treating it with in my analysis. And none of this critique was a disproof of any particular point I was saying, but it meant that I was absolutely dead set on trying to find anything and everything that I missed. So, my goal with this channel isn't to share my ideas. I don't care who's in the spotlight. I just want to understand what's going on, and I want to share it. This time around, my ideas weren't good enough, and I had a sense of why this was happening. One of my teachers, Teacher 5, used to refer to this as little person theory. The little person theory, okay? The little person theory means this. That basically a lot of people tend to approach anything about kids, teaching kids, parenting kids, whatever it is, as if kids are just adults, but physically smaller. Like you take an adult psyche and you take away some experience, you nerf a bunch of stats, shrink it to 50%, and that's what a child is. And that's not true. That's just not what's going on. Children are absolutely not just tiny adults. Their internal worlds work differently on so many levels. And in order to understand that, in order to understand how children work, you need to understand how children work. You need to study children specifically. You need familiarity with children specifically. My theory reeked of little person theory because that's not an academic background or familiarity that I have like at all. I'm not a child psychologist. I don't have kids. And realizing that I merely knew what I wanted to do with this video. I have a senpai who has the same academic background as me. We were both students of the same teachers and he does have an academic background in psychology. He's a mental health counselor who's done extensive clinical work with children specifically. So I thought I should just ask him. So I went and I forced him to watch my neighbor Totoro and then I grilled him on every aspect I wanted to understand from a child psychologist perspective and what he had to say absolutely blew my mind. So allow me to present the analysis with my commentary of my brilliant friend and senpai Jonah. So I didn't start by explaining my whole theory to Jonah, I didn't want to muddy the waters, but I did reference the fact that I was intuitively sensing some connection between the children's lack of a parent and the type of parental caregiver role Totoro was filling for them. And Jonah challenged that right away, and he proceeded to present to me an entirely new category that I found fascinating. That's interesting that you're describing it as a parental figure because to me it, it seems like a protector but one that exists outside of the parental sort of dynamic and identity and it's a sort of wish for that companion that caregiver who's not a parent and stepping out of those dynamics which obviously the relationship for the parent and child and the need of the child for the parent is very deep but there's also a lot of complexities to those relationships. And you know, just taking the title, My Neighbor, Totoro, there's I think something that that captures about having this fantasy figure who is uh, a protector, but not a parent, maybe can be a companion in a certain sense, or a pet or 
something that can embody these different qualities without, again, some of the baggage and some of the complications that exist in the parent-child dynamics. You know, there is something very powerful that children feel, particularly in this context with a sick parent, where there is uh, the neediness, um, the desperation to have the parent close, but there also is the anger, the pain that the parent left and is gone, and the uh, intensity of that relationship leading to those really deep feelings. And in, in that situation, feelings of abandonment, uh, loneliness, those being also the, the other side of the love and connection and, and wanting that closeness, particularly with, uh, with the mom being sick and in the hospital. There also are in other ways that kids and, and we love our parents, but that they also can get us frustrated. They also might have demands placed upon us your homework of school be a good girl good boy and you know so there is the, the loving impulse and the hating impulse of i don't like that you're controlling me and telling me what to do and sometimes making me feel bad so something that this character and this figure totoro can be holding is that repository of those positive qualities and that wish for protector and caregiver while also not having the demands, not having the frustrations. I mean, Totoro doesn't say anything. It doesn't right. doesn't do anything that that makes the kids upset. And I think it's a very powerful image for a child. Jonah asked me what I thought about the old neighbor character, the grandma, and I said to me it seemed like another parental type figure who was stepping in to do parental duties in lieu of their mother. Yeah, but not a mother, right? Which I think is right. key. It's a, a grandma, and uh, you know, there being something about having a replacement mother which would feel too threatening uh because they don't want a, a new mother they want their mother so there is a certain safety that's offered by having a grandmother mm -hmm. figure there which allows them to have some of that satisfaction and some of that right. need for someone in that role without feeling threatened uh by having a new figure coming in feeling uh, positively towards this new mother. What does that mean about my real mother? Am I being bad for liking this mother? Should I hate her? Um, so that that kind of softens some of that conflict. The framework underlying all this was just as much something I lacked familiarity with. And this was the key for me understanding exactly what Miyazaki was getting at with a story that treated magic in this specific way for children at this specific age. Listen to this. From a developmental perspective, there's a train of thought that looks at the child as deriving from an earlier stage where there's an undifferentiated unity between mother and infant and that the infant isn't born with a sense of i-ness that i exist and there's a world out there that's separate from me it's something that's on its way to becoming an i to becoming an individual and the infant hasn't yet carved out a separate I and me, and this is the external environment. And so there is this sort of fusion of a certain oneness with self and the world and other, and at a certain stage, uh, and many theorists talk about how frustration is what brings that about, that there's the wish for, uh, for food, for pleasure, for whatever, uh, needs are rising, and there's a delay between the satisfaction of that wish and uh, you know, when the wish arose, and there starts to become there's a me who has wishes and needs, and there's an outside world, and there's this outside person who is separate from me. And so um, that is one way of looking at these kind of edible dynamics that there is the Part of us that wants to return to that undifferentiated fusion where we feel that oneness with the world with the mother and what she symbolizes and the part of us that wants to retain our independence our separateness and fears the the loss of that that would come with that uh with that sort of fusion and returning to that stage you may have heard that humans are different than 
other animals, other mammals in, in uh, many ways, but one in particular is that human infants are uh, helpless, basically, for the first two years of, of life. And the um, reason that's proposed is that because our heads are so big, uh, we have larger brains, if our heads and our brains would be any bigger, we wouldn't be able to fit through the birth canal. So there is a kind of continuous development that occurs that in other animals that's still in, in the in the womb, uh, that for human infants, it's almost like there's it's like a perpetuation of that stage but outside the womb where there is this development that's going on in, in that stage of helplessness. And so I kind of see a similarity um, in a certain sense is that there are these stages that uh, are important for children to go through before eventually maturing into a well-adjusted adult. And one of those being having a stage where there is a certain a way for them to retreat and go into a world that can feel magical, where they can feel this omnipotence. It can feel like they have a, a certain power that slowly over time they realize you know they adjust to the the reality when i went to jonah i wasn't looking for him to give me a complete cohesive theory that explained the story as a whole i was going to him to try to understand the psychological underpinnings of what was going on with these children but what he gave me did in the end paint a really cohesive picture and honestly did just ring truer to me it made so much sense this was not magic destroying opportunities for childhood development this was childhood development the magic wasn't shielding children from the kind of discomfort and pain that leads to growth on the contrary these kids are very much exposed the pains and frustrations of their situation, they are absolutely feeling all of that. And they are growing from it. They are becoming more responsible and more empowered, Satsuki especially. They're becoming more proactive, as we see with May's exploration of her environment. And yes, the corn plant too. But the danger here is that May in particular is still very much in that helpless stage of development. And that is coinciding with her first cognitive encounter of the concept of an outside world. And if you just take a moment and think about what could happen if this child's mind forms an opinion of the world while in that stage of helplessness, while in that stage where physically she is not designed to survive in this world. What is the outcome of that? Jonah tells us exactly what would happen. Going back to what I was saying with the uh, frustration being a way that uh, we develop our individuality. We're aware of a, a world out there that's not just the same as the one that I'm wishing. But when that frustration is too intense, uh, comes too early, then you have the infant that develops this notion that the world is painful and it's scary and it doesn't care about me. It doesn't, it's not a place I can feel good. And that's where you have the most powerful trauma and the most difficult um, to work with from a clinical perspective is because there is something that is imbued on a, a very fundamental level uh, the world isn't safe. The world doesn't feel good. Um, and it, you know, it's very hard to work through that and, and get to a, another stage where uh, that starts to shift. There's an odd detail about the form that this movie's magic takes that changes the nature of the messaging behind it. Right after May discovers Totoro for the first time, Satsuki comes home from school and she finds her asleep in the middle of the garden. And May wakes up asking where Totoro went, and Satsuki is confused and she says, Totoro, you mean a troll like the one in your storybook? The fact that the magic May saw just happens to match up with a character in a storybook she loves, that detail is intended to make us ask the question, is any of this movie's magic actually real? Or is all of this just children using their imagination? And Miyazaki loves maneuvering his fantasy stories into exactly this kind of ambiguity. Chihiro at the end of Spirited Away loses all her memories of the spirit world, and then the final shot we get that glimmer of her hair tie, and we know, even if she doesn't, that yes, the magic was in fact real. And same thing in Totoro, we wonder if only the children can see the magic because it's just their imagination, and then this fact about Totoro being from May's picture book definitely makes us more skeptical, but then we see in the very end that May did deliver the corn to her mom. So Totoro, the cat 
us all of it was real. And the hyper-rationalist cynic, i.e. me, is going to look at that and say, but in real life it is their imagination because magic obviously doesn't exist. In fact, that's what I did say just a few minutes ago. But if you think about Jonah's explanation, My Neighbor Totoro is a story about children facing a truly terrible time in their life and coming out the other end of it intact, mentally healthy, and not traumatized. And that's in part because of what we think is their imagination, but turns out to be magic. Children encounter the world at a time in their life when it is a harsh, unfriendly place that they as children cannot survive in. They are helpless, and every child, doesn't matter who you are, every kid faces struggles that are beyond their capacity to cope with. They don't have the physical or mental strength. And your parents get you through some of it, and some of it in the moment you do learn to cope with, you do develop, you do mature, but the rest of it is your imagination literally protecting you, keeping you faithful that the world is a friendly, wonderful place. Even if for a helpless four-year-old, that's simply not true. And that is incredible. It is practically miraculous that millions upon millions of helpless kids have in real life gone through the worst trials and tribulations the world has to offer, and not all of them, but still so many of them have been mentally protected because of imagination, because of a child's ability to play and pretend and see magic where there isn't any. Because of the fantastical story stories kids tell themselves during what would otherwise traumatize them for life. The ability that all children have to disengage when their psyche senses that things are getting too tough. And meanwhile, they are growing more, they're developing more. You realize that the upshot of the ending is that we're no longer meant to ask, was it real magic or was it their imagination? We're meant to understand a child's imagination is real magic. It's a beautiful idea. And I could have left it at that, made a video, been totally satisfied. But if you're a longtime viewer of the channel, you probably know what's coming next. I'm rarely satisfied with just one good answer. I like to gather as many good answers as I can. So I, in fact, have another senpai. Actually, this person is both of our senpais. And you'll hear her analysis of Totoro in just a second. But this has specifically to do with one more aspect of the movie that Jonah gave a take on that honestly surprised me. It was a really perceptive opinion about Satsuki and May's dad, made a lot of sense, but it took someone who could really take a step back from the starry experience and view what was going on with a critical eye to have a take like this. So let me play you what he said. Um, but, you know, speaking to more generally the, the dad and his role and uh, his parenting, there are those moments where he's playing with them and, you know, he's following them into the forest and it's very sweet him engaging with them in that way. He's pretty clearly taking the strategy of insulating them and protecting them from really how exposed they are to the situation. And it's understandable there's a lot of parents who take that approach there is a pretty significant risk with taking that approach because if things aren't okay and doesn't work out the way that everyone's hoping uh, that could be that much more devastating for a child in addition to let's say losing one of their parents there's also the betrayal of feeling that my other parent lied to me and not being able to have that trust moving forward and losing a great deal of safety that's derived from the reliance on parents. But I would say, uh, even though obviously it did work out really well, and it was a happy ending, there does seem to me like there's something about the parenting that feels like it just wasn't attuned to what the kids were going through. Um, the intensity of the conflicts, of the emotions that were brought up, and with that desire of protecting them, that it seems like there was a lot that wasn't really being seen. Um, perhaps there was also an element of him protecting himself from the discomfort and the difficulty of really taking them and their emotions seriously and the ramifications of that. So I, I do feel like they're could have been more to be done as far as validating their feelings, helping them understand their emotions and what was coming up, rather than providing the reassurance and saying, don't worry, things will be okay. There's certainly a place for that. Mm -hmm. And there is a certain amount of protection and insulation that is important for kids to have. Um, you can kind of have a debate about where that line is. But there also is the significance and, and value for kids to feel like what they're going through, what they're experiencing is real, is worthy of respect, is something that can be recognized by them and by their caregivers to help them manage it, to help them process and deal with those feelings. And 
without saying it with total confidence and certainty, but I did get the sense that some of the intensity of how those feelings were manifesting and they running away and feeling the burden that Satsuki was holding and taking care of me, that perhaps some of that could have been alleviated more if there was more of an attunement and conversation about the complexity of mm-hmm. what they were feeling. How do you do that with a kid Satsuki's age? I could see having that conversation. Now, what would that look like with me, you know, four-year-old kid? Yeah, she's four, right? So it is likely not going to be focusing as much on the details and that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. but being able to recognize what she's feeling and expressing that that's normal and that's okay for her to feel mm-hmm. the fear, um, just how terrifying it is with not knowing where mommy is, what's going on with her. And, you know, you can couple that with that the doctors are there, they're taking care of her, she's recovering, and, you know, she's getting better. And we hope that she's coming back soon without necessarily presenting it as absolutely and as certainly as it was. And uh, just giving her more space to understand and connect with those feelings. And it's normal to have mentioned before the anger, just being able to hold the space and allow the child to feel that what is going on inside of me is okay, is acceptable. You can start to develop a certain form to it with having that input and uh, containment that a parent can provide. And, you know, it also depends on how the mom is doing and the severity of it, maybe to give uh, the the dad more the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she was getting better and it was uh, more clear that she would be returning. So then in that situation, there's, uh, okay, you know, she's getting better. She's going to be back soon. But if... That's not quite the situation, and if you're wrong about that, uh, just like I mentioned before, that it can be really disruptive and uh, take its toll in quite a few different powerful ways. And I guess that did kind of happen with the whole thing of expecting her to come home for that one weekend, and then when she didn't, then there was, you know, that was kind of what set set off the whole last act, you know, with with me running away. Yeah, and I think that's a great example of yeah how how that could backfire. And her hopes are set on mommy coming back, and um, just feeling that frustration uh, and the desperation of wanting to see her, wanting to do something. Now, I'm cutting out parts of the recording. Joan acknowledged that this is a very difficult situation and everyone was doing their best. It's not like the father was to blame. And I think that's why he worded it the way he did, that there's a risk with the father's parenting style and it may be connected with the lack of attunement with what the girls are going through. But everything he's describing not only fits, but it makes sense with other parts of the story. The idea of conjuring up this non-parental protector, that's also a possible result of this friction. And then also the crisis of May working out this plan in the end, which was a plan that really didn't make any sense but may had no one to tell her that so this was the point where jesse my other senpai had the complete opposite opinion and there were three points of disagreement between jonah and jesse this one was the first totally unprompted this is actually the first thing jesse wanted to talk about with the story i i remember i really liked the dad i thought he was a role model that you don't really see in a lot of movies nowadays or that i've ever seen like a dad who's just very very present for his kids even though he wasn't really present because he was also absent because he was dealing with so much with his wife but from their perspective, he was very hands-on and very positive and very loving and very there when they needed him, even though physically he was often not there. I went to Jonah to hear a clinical perspective, and I went to Jesse to hear a parental perspective. Jesse has five children, and like I said, she's a very respected scholar in my community, and she's just wise. Like, sometimes you meet people and it's like, whoa, that person's wise. And right away she picked up on something that I would bet 90% of people who watch this movie overlook. It was also one of the first things she said to me. I was not expecting her to start there, but almost as soon as we started talking about Totoro, she was like, that house sucked. And that led to her read on the father's unusual but brilliant parenting style and i'm just gonna let her cook here for a bit because this is so interesting i remember that house when they came into their new house that was just a horrible horrible house it was the worst house it was it was like haunted and it was crappy and it was falling apart and it was just garbage and mm-hmm. he walks in like oh our new house it's so exciting it's so great he is, it gives us everything such a positive spin that i really just loved watching him 
be so positive and, and it was all they danced and it was so exciting and everything was wonderful and then they see these like little freaky those little soot monsters are, are really scary i think like for a kid you know when you're in the haunted type of a house that's it's that's yucky and full of spider webs, then it really feels very scary and unnerving and like there's monsters everywhere and whatever internal stuff you're going through, it's all manifest there in, in, those, in those corners, the dark corners of the house is all like your psyche. And so they're seeing these things, but then when they go to their, to their father and also grandma, right? Grandma was there. So grandma, both of them have this idea. It's like an idea that if you're lucky, you get to see them, if you're lucky. And I was thinking more about it because also maybe they'll end up leaving. But like, why would they end up leaving? If you're lucky and they're good, then they should then they should stay. You would want them. But the fact is, like, nobody wants them there because they're scary. But they made it like you're lucky if you see them. But then if you were if you were welcoming and warm to them and they were okay with you and they liked you, then they would move on somewhere else. So it really is taking something that's a very scary thing for them and giving them a framework of positivity where they can um embrace and see what's the darkness and the scary things that are happening but put it in a very positive frame that if they're lucky and they're open to these experiences then it could be very exciting and wonderful how do you weigh that versus like telling the kid like oh there's nothing to worry about like not like a necessarily like a denial way but like showing them like look like there's nothing here right i mean i i don't think it's ever good to tell a kid there's nothing to worry about if the kid is worried then there's something to worry about what, even if it's in their own mind, if it's their own feelings or their own fears, there's, they're not making stuff up from nowhere. There's something that's disturbing them. But at the same time, I think we had been talking about like whether or not this whole magical thing was an appropriate thing to do for children as a parent. So I don't know that I would parent my children that way. I don't know that I would tell my children, oh, there's magic and you can, if you're welcoming, then the shadows and it'll come. But I think that what the movie does for children who are watching it is that the movie is like a metaphor. And the movie is telling the story of deep, dark things and sad things that are happening and giving them a positive frame. And the father is giving them a positive frame. I don't know that I would necessarily tell those specific types of ideas to children, but definitely a child watching it comes away with a more positive, optimistic, um, open attitude towards the dark things that are happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. So as far as like... Totoro himself. What do you think that was for May and for like May. for you know in that moment, you know, with the at the bus stop? What do you think Totoro right, was? Right, the bus stop. I love that bus stop. Yeah. So I think that for May, who's um grappling on a much more uh primitive level than her older sister, because she really has she's not so verbal, she doesn't really know what's happening at all. Um and then she goes and she's lonely a lot she's alone and she has no idea what's going to be with her mom and she's just left on her own for so many hours and like with her thoughts or with her feelings or with her fears and she ends up stumbling across this monster but the monster which is terrifying she's not scared of the monster and the monster is very protective so i think it's doing the same thing that that their father sets up for them which is that there is a very big scary monstrous situation but if you come to it with a certain openness and delight and cheer and curiosity, then you could have a wonderful time. And the thing that is so scary and so terrifying is good and protective and caring. And like that's not reality. In reality, the things that are scary are scary. But just giving them a model of like life, life, it's more like life. Life, it can be um positive and protecting and caring it's not just the scary thing like you can be open it's a certain attitude and um so as far as the bus stop situation so she's having all this these are having this terrible situation their mother is gone their mother is sick they don't know when she's going to get better they don't know and their father is gone working very long hours for a really really long time and that time where they're sitting at the bus stop and it's just he's it's the latest bus and it's so late at night and he's not coming and they're waiting and waiting and it's pouring and she's holding um she's holding may and may is tired and they just have no more resources there are no more resources and their father's not there and nothing's there and then they look and totoro's sitting there he's like there he's there waiting with them and like what does that mean that even in their worst moment like their biggest fears and their biggest problems are there they're not it's like right next to you but what if she gave him an umbrella and she was kind and she was loving and she was warm. And like then I think, is that when the bus came? This That crazy bus came? Did they come in yeah, that the, scene the, or not? Yeah, the cat bus comes and Toto yeah, gets so, into it. And then after, only yeah. after that, then the father's bus comes in. 
Right. So it's like it's sort of like setting up this scene of there's this rescue. There is this goodness that is going to come and is going to be there. And there are more um, resources. There are more resources. There are wonderful resources because those resources come back later. So that's what that's what helps her with the corn in the end. That's how they bring the corn to the mom with that with the bus. What do you mean when you're saying resources? What do you mean by that? Um, I don't. I could mean either emotional internal resources or external. The world gives you stuff when you have a certain open mindedness to the world and a positive approach. Then things work out in a different kind of a way. And I think that they were taught by their father that even in this terrible, horrible situation of loneliness and despair, they weren't feeling loneliness and despair. They had they had Totoro who was there, who was and they were nice to him and he was and and he was friendly and then they got this weird interesting bus which is like ooh what's that that's exciting that's magical what's going to happen it's like it turned everything around and everything was was interesting and exciting and magical when it was really the worst despair and you know objectively it was it was horrible but to them it was a very magical exciting situation because i think the frame that their father set up for them jonah's analysis saw totoro for two of his most prominent traits the vitality the sisters wish they saw in their mother and perhaps the presence they wish they could get from their father that was his idea of this non-parental protector or caregiver but i think jesse's theory saw totoro more simply as just what he was a monster a manifestation of fear. There's a reason why these kids weren't subconsciously conjuring up magical imaginary beings who appeared more parental. Now, just like we mentioned before, Totoro was a troll from May's picture book. He is a monster. You can even see in her drawing, he's supposed to be kind of scary. And giant monster roaring at you is pretty scary. And all the monsters in the story, because Jesse's right, the suit sprites were also just creepy crawly monsters, are showing up in accordance with the typical monster scaring kids schedule. You got the classic little kid has to go into the cellar to fetch something for an older family member. You have May being left alone, going too deep deep into the forest. You got waking up in the middle of the night, there's a monster outside your window. And of course the other classic, kid is abandoned without parents on a dark road at night. So what's happening to these kids in their inner emotional worlds is what happens to most kids. I think what follows from what Jesse is saying is this. Yes, it is true that the father has not taken an approach of validating his kids' feelings in the way that Jonah described, i.e. talking them through their conflicts, helping them to understand that it's normal to have these feelings, making peace with them, and in doing so maybe alleviating the kind of friction which is pushing them towards this non-parental care caregiver of Totoro. The father has not done that because instead of dealing with these feelings one by one on a micro level, the father instead has imparted an entire framework where the kids are doing this for themselves automatically to some degree. They themselves are witnessing their own emotions boiling over internally and spilling out into this magical imaginary manifestation of their biggest, darkest, scariest thoughts and feelings. But where other children would encounter that monster and be terrified, Sasuke may have been brought up by the this man who is kind and loving and positive as a part of his entire approach to everything in his life. And for his kids, specific emphasis has been put on being loving with things in their lives that are uncomfortable and scary. Their father has trained them to be especially open with confronting that part of their childhood experience and really to see the dark parts of their life as seamless with the rest of their exploration of their world and of themselves. It's a much more holistic approach to the same underlying issue that Jonah's approach was dealing with on a particular basis. And really it is just a beautiful way to live life and to raise a child. And it's not to say that life suddenly becomes all rainbows and smiles because you treat it that way. Life is still hard sometimes, really, really hard. But this leads to the third point of conflict between Jonah and Jesse's analyses. The first one being the dad's parenting. Second, what is Totoro? A manifestation of a wish for non-parental protector or a monster, a manifestation of fear. The third point of conflict was about Act 3. For Jonah, this is the dad's parenting backfiring, so to speak. May running away was a crisis caused by the lack of emotional attunement. Her emotional needs were just not being met. She didn't know how to deal with that. And the resulting extreme desperation that was left unchecked caused this near disaster which was only reined in by the power of imagination. Jessie, on the other hand, didn't see the end as a crisis. She saw it as a triumph. Here's her talking about Act 3 as a whole. So the first thing I was thinking about with me with the corn was that it was a very accidental comment that set May on her path. I, I was trying to remember what it was, but I think she was just talking to the grandma about the vegetables and the grandma was just saying how the vegetables are so good and so nutritious and like anyone who lives off the, you know, has these vegetables is going to have a uh, strong, healthy body. And then May got this idea in her head, which nobody intended for her to get, that if her mother just had this corn, that she would get better or be able to come home. Like you, kids get these ideas in their head and they're, they're strange and we don't know where they came from, but it is very logical. When you see what happened, you, it's 100% understandable why May thought that. And But looking at it from the outside, you'd be like, what is this kid thinking? Why is this kid, where'd they get this idea? And it 
makes it come true or makes yeah. them be effective in fantasy. Like it, it says, your idea is a good idea. Your idea, you should try to get your ideas um, to fruition. Take your ideas, try to work them out. And what she did, she made a huge mess. Every The whole village was looking for her. Everybody was terrified. Everybody was freaking out. Like you could turn this around and say, you're a troublemaker, you're naughty, you didn't care about anybody. But like she was very persistent about this goal, this idea that she had. And the movie used magic to make it happen. And it was like the cat bus, like all of her, all of her fears and all of her things were all like used as fuel to the, making this work out. And the movie I think was giving children a message of your ideas may seem weird to everybody else or incomprehensible to everybody else but your ideas have a logic to them and you should stick with them and you should persist in them and and they're good so I, I like that idea a lot I thought that was a good concept for children and it's nice mm -hmm. as, as opposed, so as opposed to like obviously like telling her the other extreme of saying like you know you're bad you should have you know you shouldn't have run away with that you know like i see how that could be harmful to tell but um and also your idea is stupid your idea is pointless your idea won't work like why don't you understand that your idea won't work you know you can't give a kid a mom a corn a magic corn and it's not going to make her better like where'd you get this crazy idea that's what people say a lot. Where'd you get that crazy idea? Yeah, right. Like a kid doesn't have a crazy idea. Kids have creative ideas. Kids have ideas based on their limited understanding. So you could talk to them and ask them where and try to uncover what they're thinking. And then maybe you could gently expand the facts so that they understand a little better that maybe that won't work the way they imagine, but it's worth trying. It's worth, and I think in my own experience with children, I think that an idea is crazy and then I say, all right, let's try it. And it often works out or at least 50% of the time it works out decently or better than decently. So like, why not give them a chance? And then you're, everyone asks, where's all the creativity that children have? They don't have any creativity. Well, maybe if adults would gently allow them to, to, you know, embody their ideas, then maybe that would, they would be more creative because they work at least half the time, you know, as mm -hmm. much as our ideas okay. work. Yeah, just give me, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you do see that in this movie that you know, she gets the corn to the mom and the mom finds it and it's like this really like special moment for her also. And, you know, like like not to say necessarily that it fueled her body, but, you know, like it, it, it made her feel better, you know, and, and, and you're right, like it works, you know, like it, right. like it in, in some way, yeah, in some way it works. And I think that it's important that it's May. It's not even, Satsuki is a very, um, She's intelligent, she's older, she's capable. But the point is that this little girl, this tiny little girl with her weird, wacko idea about the world and her barely formed concepts of how reality works was able to have an idea, follow it through, and have it work. That's the important thing. Because hmm. it wouldn't be as exciting if Satsuki did it because it's May. May's the one who, like, who represents all children's... Um, barely formed ideas that they have about the world and how it should be and how it can go. That's the same thing that we were talking about because the adults around her do mm -hmm. not, like she's, she's imagining things. She's, she's showing them an imaginary right. monster that doesn't exist. So the normal thing is, oh, you're making up stuff. Oh, you have an imagination, like to put down the kid. But they say to her, oh, you did see something. It was real. If you really have the right attitude, it'll come back if you're lucky. Same type of an idea that they're giving her, which in mm -hmm. real life, I wouldn't tell a child that. I wouldn't tell a child that whatever you're imagining is real. But like the idea of whatever sense you have about the situation, stick with your concept of the situation because you're not wrong. And if you're lucky, well, you'll encounter it again. Like mm -hmm. your, your grasp of reality, even though to me and my older vision like looks nonsensical, but they're supportive of her. And if she's fortunate, she'll see it more. I wouldn't say that to a kid in real life. Like if a kid is telling me that I have my friend, my imaginary friend, my imaginary friend, and they want to introduce and oh, I can't find it. I, I don't think I would actually say to a real child, oh, it must be there. And if you're lucky, you'll see it. I, I won't say that. But this idea that it represents the child's understanding of reality, which doesn't make sense to the adult. And the adult says, I really believe that whatever you're seeing and however you're thinking about the situation is valid and probably good and productive and useful and if you stick with that i think that good things will come so that's the message that they're both giving her 
So yes, granted, it was a triumph that came accompanied by a near crisis, but I think you really do need that degree of precision in how you think about the what here. May's chosen course of action resulted in problems for her, for her family, for her community. That must be acknowledged. But you can think about what she did as a person, her decision itself. You can take that and consider it alone, separate from all the other effects it had. And in that respect, you see this really was the climax of her entire character arc. You have this four-year-old kid who is incredibly emotionally needy, who is always being taken care of because she's four and four-year-olds do have a lot of emotional needs and this four-year-old girl when she's abandoned when she's alone at the height of her pain decides to do something on her own for someone who she really cares about she realizes that she doesn't have to be the one being taken care of all the time she has to approach this with the warmth and with the openness and love that her father taught her and if she does that she can be the one to take care of her mom and she tries really really hard and of course she can't do it by herself but doing it by herself forget that who cares about that Give it a couple years, she'll be fine doing stuff on her own. You look at Satsuki, that is where Mei is headed. She's going to grow up wonderfully capable and independent, just like her older sister. But the vital development here is Mei's mental shift. She finds an important goal that she cares about, she wants to work towards. She comes up with a plan all by herself, and she decides all on her own, I can do this, I'm going to do this. How many four-year-olds do you know who can do any step of that? How many adults do you know who can do any step of that? On a mental level, to break out of the mold of the bigger people in our lives, who set goals for us and have us working towards towards their expectations, making plans and goals and assessing ourselves based on their standards, may cast that aside and does all of it by herself at the age of four. That is beyond admirable, and it's powerful as a moment to capture in a story like this as well, because it is that discovery, that drive, that initiative, which leads to kids becoming truly healthily empowered. It's not being big enough or strong enough or smart enough. That's going to come with time. That's secondary. It barely matters. It's the creative, willful spirit of I that starts out as pure imagination, it starts as silly, pretend fun, but when you turn that creativity and that steadfast belief in your own vision towards the real world, as you naturally do as you grow older, it is that same silly, fun, imaginative faculty that matures into the creativity and drives that adults use to invent machines that perform miracles and send rockets to the moon and come up with the most brilliant theories of math and philosophy and what have you. That stuff needs intelligence and strength and experience, but what it comes from is trusting your own vision of the world. May is the first few steps of that journey. She's a child with a brilliant imaginative faculty that's just starting to turn the corner to affix itself to real life plans. And that underappreciated triumph of children taking that next developmental step, that is a beautiful topic to make a children's story about. It's beautiful to focus on the passionate, brave, scary, not so pretty reality of children reaching that state and doing their first truly wonderful thing on their own. That's why this is such a beloved movie. I had the strong and somewhat distasteful reaction to the magic in My Neighbor Totoro, distasteful to myself and no doubt distasteful to the ears of Miyazaki if he had heard it, Jessie explained to me how she thought kids would see a story like this and why she thought it was such a positive thing. And she explained it through an anecdote about a story she used to tell her own youngest child. But I was saying how, how having a fantasy movie is, is useful for children. Because I think that when, when I was, I first thought that you only want children to see reality. You don't want, like, what's a magical story going to, how is it going to help them? But I was talking about how metaphors help children even when they don't know what the metaphor is. So, and they don't, they don't know what's happening. And it, and it hits them on sort of a subconscious level where they don't really realize what they're embracing about the story. So the story that I told you, that I told Aaron, was that um, when he was very young, he's the youngest of all the kids and he never could keep up so much. Um, he was always running behind and, and, not, and not being as big as he wanted to be. And he comprehended that there was bigger and stronger and faster and he wasn't it. It was very hard for him emotionally. So he didn't know that that's what I was doing. But I used to tell him this story a lot of times at bedtime that there was this little apple on a tree and it was smaller than all the other apples. And every night the, the apple would say to his mom, I'm so small, I'm so small, I can't do anything, I can't, I'm, I want to be as big as all the other apples. And the mom would say to him, every, every time he said that, the mom would say to him, don't worry, one day you're going to be as big as all the other apples. Maybe you'll even be bigger than the other apples. Don't worry, you'll be big. And then the apple would say, no, I can't, it's not. And they would go back and forth about this and finally would say, oh, fine. And then one day the apple was big and he was so happy. And that was it. And so, and I used to tell him that, Every time he, every time you'd have like a bad day about being small, I would tell him that story. And then um, a few, a few years ago, he said to me, he's now taller than I am. And a few years ago, he, a few, not years, weeks ago, months ago, he said, "Hey, mom, remember that story? I love that story." And like he was reminiscing about the story, but I don't think that he 
knew what I was trying to do. I don't think he understood what it meant to him or, or that it had anything to do with his life at all. I think that he just liked the story. So, but it was really, I was trying to give him a tale, give him coping mechanisms. And I think that's what this movie is trying to do. It's a movie that's trying to give children coping mechanisms or trying to tell children that they have agency, that they have the ability to cope, that the things that are scary are not so scary and not so horrible, that all the, um, that really objectively hard things are there, but, but a good attitude does make a difference. Those are all things that the, that the movie is telling these children. And even if they don't, realize they directly map it to their situation they definitely are grasping that on an intuitive level and that's what the movie does so to some of these two analyses of my neighbor totoro jonah sees the story as exploring the stage of development where children are separating from their parents starting to become acquainted with the concept of an outside world but built into that same psyche that's being hurt and being frustrated by the friction of that world's introduction and by the friction of parents having lives outside of you built into that psyche is tools of protection imagination specifically that can help children emerge into their fully developed selves without trauma closing them off and pushing them further and further into the dark belief that the world isn't a good place for them. It's too harsh. It's too full of malice. Maybe it's more worthwhile to withdraw further and further until the world feels safe, even if what you're left with is the most basic meaningless remnants of existence to comprise this new world you've built for yourself. Hold on, did I, did I accidentally slip into analyzing a different movie there for a second? My bad. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, it's about the magic of childhood resilience and the role played by the imagination. Jesse, on the other hand, sees the story as a demonstration of specific childhood coping mechanisms and mindsets that Miyazaki rightly sees as aiding a magically triumphant childhood. Namely, that you can confront your fears and your discomfort with warmth and love and openness, and that you can feel encouraged as a kid in your own way of seeing the world, even if adults don't get it. And that's because it's your fun, silly imagination that eventually leads to your ability to do things in the world, to discover what you care about, and to pursue that, and to find success in that. That's not something that adults automatically have. Kids develop that by themselves, and kids can do stuff like that by themselves. They can have a profound impact on the world, even before they fully understand things, even when they're too small to get places. They can still do incredible things, and it's all due to the brilliant, insightful way they're starting to see the world, the mind that's truly you and only you, even when it's just at the beginning of its growth. I love both of these Totoro analyses. They do see some components in the movie in conflicting ways, but still they don't contradict each other. If anything, they complement one another, as all beautiful ideas do. The dad's parenting style was really insightful and had the potential to produce truly healthy, happy children who matured into healthy, happy adults. And it also carried risks. Both of these things can be true, and they are true. Totoro was a monster. He can be accurately seen as a psychological representation of dark emotions like fear, but also emotional needs like craving parental love. Again, both can be true. And of course, the climax was a crisis, but a crisis is where we do see triumph. Pain and discomfort and danger is often the only places people can grow and develop in the most amazing ways. There's no inconsistencies there either. It just goes to show how deep Miyazaki's intuitive grasp of childhood is and how ingeniously he expresses it in his storytelling. When we fall in love with a movie like Totoro, that's what we're falling in love with. That depth and that magic. Subscribe! How did you understand Totoro when you first watched it? I would love to hear more approaches. Please comment any thoughts you have there's so much to explore in the story. I'm super happy whenever I get to showcase people from the academic environment that I come from because they're all just super smart and I'd be nowhere without them, but also because their ideas themselves are also just brilliant and razor sharp and powerful. And I know that if you appreciate my ideas, you'll appreciate theirs too. On that note, Jessie wrote a book recently where she analyzes sex scandals in the Bible. If you like what she had to say here, go ahead and check that out. Her ideas are very consistently awesome. Jonah, as I said, is a mental health counselor. If you like what he had to say, you can check out his website here. Seriously, I just want to give both of them so much gratitude for helping me with this video. This whole thing was literally their ideas. So huge thank you to them. Also, we hit 300,000 subscribers. Thanks all of you so much for the support. For some reason, 300k feels like big boy YouTube numbers more so than the other milestones for me. It's incredible. It's been so amazing making these videos and growing this community. I've been so busy lately, I haven't even thought about what I'm going to do for 300k, but I'll figure out something. Stay tuned for that. Thanks as always, truly, 
from the heart for all of your support. And thanks also to the patrons for all of their support. And speaking of community, there is going to be a Schnee Channel fan meetup on March 29th in Seattle, Washington at SakuraCon. Not in the convention itself, outside of it, meaning you don't need to be a paid attendee of the convention. I would love to meet all of you, so follow me on Twitter at JD underscore Schnee. For more details about that, I can be releasing more details as the day gets closer. Another thing I want to mention at the end of this video, this is actually my third video on Studio Ghibli stuff, even though if you look at my channel, you'll only see two videos, this and the women one. That is because Studio Ghibli issued a worldwide block on my first video, which was one of my favorite videos that I've ever made. It was analyzing the train scene in Spirited Away, like super duper in depth. So that is gone from YouTube, but it's still available here or via the links below for free on Patreon and on Twitter. So if you like this video, you'll probably like that too. Go ahead and check that out. And I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.